Well, thank you, um, yeah, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, for thought in terms of um, business thinking and some of the different perspectives that we need to consider when we begin to think about sustainable impact from development interventions. Now, first of all, I have to acknowledge the work of my colleagues, Jasper Baus and Pai Drexel, who are not here for um, the description of some of the business models that I'll be making reference to here in my presentation. And so um, we're all advocating for the inclusion or the incorporation of market-driven mechanisms into um, development projects and why this is necessary to begin to consider these. Um, and so the major question um, remains, why is this important? Now, if we... Um, consider what is currently going on with development projects. This is what we see. Once donor funding ends, um, beneficiaries are very limited in terms of the communities where activities actually occur. And so we see that there is limited impact. Technology transfer is usually very limited as well, and there is no upscaling of these intervention activities. And some, in some cases, even worse so, adoption rates of some technologies will begin to decline. And so then we have no sustainable impact. And in that instance, we continue to see farming communities, for example, that have no access to technologies. And so regardless of the fact that we have a proliferation of different development projects, landscapes do not change and there is no impact. So in that regard, development interventions need to adopt a new way of thinking, new paradigms, where interventions have targets where we're actually upscaling um, their activities and we're looking to increasing um, impact where there is an increased number of beneficiaries from um, the transfer of, for example, these technologies. So um, in that regard, how do we actually get to the point where we're seeing upscaling of intervention activities? Well, most donors envision that their investment plans um, will not require continuous support for large-scale impact. In a sense, they're no longer willing to invest endlessly in order for us to see sustainable impact. And so then what is the alternative? What is the new paradigm that we can actually adopt to address this issue? Well, it's important that we look at donor support as mechanisms to leverage these activities where we understand that the inclusion of market-driven mechanisms is a way to actually ensure sustainable impact from development interventions. And so in that regard, how do we begin to achieve um, these targets of scaling up intervention activities? Well, in order to leverage donor investments, it's necessary that we leverage private sector um, capital. This is particularly local private sector capital, where we're including or, um, or incentivizing the participation of relevant actors um, within the sector, particularly inclusive of farmers who tend to be the beneficiaries of these development interventions. And it's also imperative that we create incentives for, the, for private sector participation. And this ranges from um, subsidies, creating subsidies for these entities, um, for example, regulating um, the capital market in order to incentivize them to um, be a part of these processes. Now, in regards to incentivizing private sector participation, it will require that innovative business models are actually developed and promoted and to very, make very clear the benefits that these actors can actually gain from investing um, in these new um, development um, initiatives. So in that regard, um, one might ask, well, business models are great tools to incentivize private sector participation, but what are business models really? Well, from MIT um, Sloan's definition, a business model is simply the way by which a business, an entity, or a system can create and capture value within a network of producers, suppliers, and consumers. So very simply, how do you generate revenue to ensure the sustainability of a system, of a business, um, long term? <clears throat> 
So in that regard, um, when we look at some development initiatives, particularly natural resource management projects, there are a variety of existing business models already that are applicable, for example, in the food industry that can um, be applied in looking at some of the issues related to natural resource management. And so, for example, we're all very familiar with payment for environmental services, beneficiary mechanisms, as well as the franchising model in the food industry, for example. Cost reduction and risk mitigation models are all very familiar in other sectors. Now, how do we consider these and do they have potential to be applied um, in development projects? <coughs> And there are other several business models that we can consider. These are just a few that um, I'll be referencing here. Um, and I'm going to illustrate these models with very simple examples and making reference to some of the IFAD projects on the way. And so for example, if we consider a business model um, for upstream and downstream soil conservation, we know that typically there is a challenge where um, land and water management practices by um, upstream users typically affect um, the water quality um, for downstream users. And so um, in this case, usually it refers to um, reservoir siltation that needs to be addressed, issues of flooding, and in a sense, sometimes even gaining access to water that upstream users usually um, divert. And in a sense, how do they sustain their interest as um, downstream users? Now, to address some of these challenges, it's important that you incentivize the upstream users to adopt new land and water management practices. Well, in order to be able to do so, there is a need for a sustainable financial mechanism because otherwise then you have costs that are skewed to one entity and this will represent a system that will not be sustainable. And so we can consider the um, payment for environmental services, which represents a viable model that can address some of these challenges related to upstream and downstream um, soil conservation issues. And so just to um, use this graphic um, that represents a general payment for environmental services business model, I'll be describing it from your right to your left. Um, in order to set up a sustainable financial mechanism where you have upstream farmers um, on your left actually adopting improved land and water management practices, you need the downstream users here, which could be your governments, your utilities, the public or the private sector, to set up a financial mechanism to support such activities. Now, these benefits um, could be in the form of funds that um, the downstream users pay to the upstream um, farmers through loans, training, hardware. In a sense, what factors or what elements can they invest in in order to trigger behavioral change? And in this model, for example, it will be important to consider a third party, which is in the middle there, a broker, um, which could be a water users association that will manage the fund and ensure that there is um, equity in terms of <clears throat> the benefits and also ensure that the upstream farmers actually do adopt the practices and change behavior. And so then you have a system here where you have different actors that are able to interplay with each other, where you, there's um, revenue um, that's being generated from taxes and tariffs, and you have entities that are able to invest in these and ensure um, the sustainability of such a model. Now, it's important to consider two major factors for the sustainability of such a model in the sense that downstream users, for example, will only invest if the marginal benefits that they are actually going to gain from the improvement of land management practices is greater than the cost of investment that they are going to make. And likewise, for the upstream users, it is important that um, the cost of them changing their behavior is actually less than the benefits that they would make from actually um, changing their behavior from improved yields. Now, it's important to know that, for example, a PES model in this case is significant significantly dependent on local settings and are context specific. 
we're all very familiar with um, in the literature where we see very few cases that have been successful. Um, and these are mainly related to convincing the investors to actually put up the funds to set up these financial um, mechanisms. Again, of course, they have to consider the risks that are associated with their investments and also the benefits. And so in thinking about such a model, some of the IFAD projects that um, this could be considered for the speed irrigation <coughs> as well as the green water credits. And um, details of these um, would be made in the next presentations. And so if we consider the franchise business model, for example, this is very prominent in the food industry, but they have potential application when we begin to think about rainwater harvesting systems. So some of the major challenges related to rainwater initiatives are that there is a need for supplemental water, particularly during seasons where there is low rainfall and there's difficulty in accessing different water sources. Now, these initiatives have focused mainly on improving technologies and identifying solutions related to such, but very limited to no effort in terms of business development and identifying market structures that will actually um, move some of these um, rainwater harvesting systems at scale and increase adoption. And so if we take, for example, the heavenly waters in India, um, one of their business models is based on a franchising model where they harvest and they store the excess water during the monsoon season for use in the dry season. And this is made based mainly on a franchising model where they obtain micro loans to support their activities. And I'm going to explain that in detail with this graphic. So for example, you can consider user community X1, which is a group of households um, that obtain um, micro loans from a microfinance institution there in the middle, where they invest in a rainwater harvesting system and infrastructure that connects the households. And so during monsoon seasons, they're able to store the excess water and then make use of this during the dry season. This represents cost savings for them. And if they sell the excess water, implies income, rev um, income generation for these households. So this allows them to pay back the microfinance institution. And you have a franchising entity there that actually supplies the infrastructure to the community and the households. They're responsible for the training, the installation, maintenance of these. Now, they're able to generate revenue from the fees that they charge the communities. The microfinance institution generates income from the loans that they give to the households. And the households benefit by saving costs from having to identify alternative sources of water during the dry seasons and also from sales to other households that do not have these um, systems. And so if you consider um, this franchise X, they would then pay franchising fees to a rainwater harvest um, parent company which in this case um, is what you see up top. And there, um, they have different franchise entities that pay fees, royalty fees back to them. Now, this system or this model is sustainable in the sense that you have different entities that have a stake in the success of others, in the sense that the success of the rainwater harvesting parent company is dependent on the success of franchise X and franchise Y, and it's depend and their success is dependent on how the user communities actually use um, the rainwater harvesting systems. And so you have interlinkages between these different players that ensure the sustainability of um, the system. And similarly, this is a model that um, could potentially be considered when we think about the rainwater harvesting system and even the smart ICT project currently funded by EFAD. And details of that um, are going to follow in subsequent presentations as well. And so lastly, this is another model, um, cost reduction risk mitigation model that can be considered when you begin to think about transfer of innovative ICT-based technologies for early warnings um, for weather and water patterns. Now, we know that in a lot, in a lot of developing countries, the, one of the biggest challenges are the high risk of crop failures. Um, this is mainly due to limited information on, on weather patterns. 
Now, while there may be innovative technologies that allow farmers to reduce this risk, usually there's limited adoption um, of these technologies, myriad um, reasons for it, but mainly because these farmers are poor and they're resource constrained. And so then you have these innovative technologies that are available, but very low adoption rates. So then a potential solution is to identify other relevant actors, stakeholders that would be interested in investing in these technologies and making them available to smallholder farmers, identifying what stick they have um, and how they would actually benefit from it. And these are outgrower companies, crop insurance companies, as well as governments. And to consider um, this graphic here, which is a simple cost reduction um, model here, you have the smart ICT provider that's providing the app, the technology that gives information on weather and water patterns. And you have the outgrowers and insurance providers. And these are the focal players in the sense that they'll be willing to invest in these ICT technologies and make them available to their farmers because in a sense they have to mitigate crop the risk of crop failure because they have to ensure that the supply of their products are consistent. And so if they have contracted out to smallholder farmers and um, the, the crops do not, um, the crops fail, then that is a huge um, loss to them. And so then it makes sense, it gives them an incentive to invest in these technologies and make them available maybe at a subsidized rate or even free to the farmers, make it mandatory for them to use these technologies. And in a sense, they benefit because then they reduce the risk of um, their crops failing at the end of the season. Insurance companies are also important focal players. The more risk you have in terms of crop failure, the more claims you're going to have at the end of the season. And so it would make sense for entities like them to invest in um, technologies that would reduce risk. And this represents cost savings and profit generation for them. And similarly, this is a model that would make sense to consider for the Smart ICT project, and I know that details of that is also going to follow in the next presentation. And so um, there are several EFAD projects, the Green Water Credit Smart ICT, Rainwater Spade, the Renew Program on Resource Recovery and Reuse, and there are myriad of business models, existing business models, though applied in different sectors, that can well be applied when we begin to think about natural resource management projects. And as you can see from the graphic, there are several that um, could be considered when we think about upscaling interventions related to these natural resource management um, initiatives. And so to conclude, um, there are several options to apply business models when we think about food security investments, um, including soil and water conservation projects. And obviously there is the need for detailed understanding and analysis before we begin to identify or develop business models that can be applied for these initiatives. And of course, business models will be context specific and location dependent as well. Well, the experience so far, there hasn't been a lot of business modeling in terms of upscaling of um, upscaling of um, development issues. Um, but then again, it goes back to the reliance on donor support. And finally, as I mentioned earlier, there's a need for detailed research when you begin to think about um, business modeling in terms of food security issues and land and water management. Thank you. <laughs>